The following is an introduction to the rendering capabilities in OpenCL Studio. At this point, it's assumed that you have a good understanding of the OpenGL API and the shading language, because OpenCL Studio only provides a thin layer of abstraction to the uh, underlying API. Uh, the reason being is that uh, it provides you with more flexibility. Plus, if you do understand OpenGL, then you will have no problem using the IDE to develop your own visualizations. So let me begin by examining the OpenGL subtree here in the tree view. And when I do a right mouse click on this node, uh, you can see a pop-up menu that shows you all of the, the OpenGL related building blocks that are available. And these are fairly basic. There is shaders uh, and there's a number of uh, different buffer types. There's vertex buffers, index buffers, and there's textures. And then we have uh, uh, constructs which are not inherent to OpenGL anymore, such as uh, light sources and transformation nodes. And then on the very bottom, there is another pop-up menu here that contains a few uh, predefined building blocks. So there's a point set, and then below here is a, a few triangle meshes. And these triangle meshes are files that sit in the workspace directory. So you can, uh, you can go there and you can deposit your own files in the directory and they will show up here in this menu. So let me begin by inserting a point set. So after I've done that, four new nodes appear here in the tree view. The first one is a shader, and this one basically applies uh, to all the geometries following it in the tree view. In this case, we only have the point set, but you could construct more complex scene trees where different shaders apply to different geometries. Uh, following the shader, there is an area buffer element, and below that, there is two vertex attributes, one for the position of every point and one for the color. Now, if I select the area buffer element and then look at the property sheet, you can see you can only change one attribute here, that's the primitive. So internally, OpenCL Studio calls the OpenGL function GLDrawArrays. And this one basically takes uh, uh, an attribute that says what kind of primitive to draw. And right now we have selected points, but I can also select lines, triangle meshes, what have you. Now if we look at the uh, vertex attribute here, this property sheet has on the left hand side, it has a file browser where you can select a PLY file from which to initialize that uh, vertex attribute. In this case, there is no file selected, and we'll see examples of that later. And then here in the middle, you can specify the dimensions of the vertex attribute buffer, as well as this data type. Okay, so let's now go ahead and have a look at the shader. So I'll now select the shader node, and click on the code tab, and here you can see the source code of that shader. And this one requires uh, a few uniform variables, as well as two vertex attributes called gsvertex, and GS colors. Now these attributes correspond to the buffers here in the tree view. So OpenCL Studio will automatically bind the buffers here to the corresponding vertex attributes. So you have to make sure that uh, you're matching the names uh, accordingly. In addition, um, OpenCL Studio also initializes the uniform variables up here, such as the model view matrix, the model view projection matrix. And you can see a complete list of inbuilt uh, attributes and uniforms over here on the right hand side. So we'll now go ahead and illustrate how to render the point set as a nicely lit spheres rather than just as simple dots. And we can do that uh, using the point sprite rendering. And there's two things that we need to do here. Uh, one is to use a different shader, and the other one is to enable points by rendering for this particular point set. And the latter we can do via the script processor. So we'll now switch over to the script processor and drag and drop the point set into one of the registers. And as you can see here, among others, there are two event handlers called pre-render and post-render. And these are basically called before and after the point set is rendered. And in here, you can see there's already some commented out source code, which is just there by default. And this is the, the OpenGL code necessary to enable point spline rendering. So I'm now going to uh, comment in this code and then compile the script. Now you can compile the script by hitting Control Q, or you can compile it by hitting the uh, red compile button up here in the top right corner. Now the source code uh, in, this, in this handler uses the GL package. 
which basically encapsulates the OpenGL API at a very low level. So what you're looking at here is the actual OpenGL calls necessary to enable and disable point sprite rendering. And uh, this has nothing to do with OpenCL Studio. And the OpenGL API is very well documented online. Also, the GL package is a Lua plugin which is distributed with OpenCL Studio, which means that the source code as well as the Visual Studio project to build this package uh, sits in the workspace directory. So if you're missing a function here, or if you'd like to add new functions or make changes to the existing functions, all you have to do is recompile the corresponding DLL, and the next time OpenCL Studio starts, um, your changes will, will be in effect. Okay, so now that I've done that, let's go back to the scene view and have a look at the point set. And as you can see, nothing has changed. It's still being rendered as, as, as little dots. And the reason is because we're still using the previous shader. In order to do point sprite rendering, we need to use a different shader. So if you select the shader up here and then look at the property sheet, you can see a, a browser over here that lets you select from a number of predefined shaders. And there are a few here and one of them is point sprites. So when I select this one, you can now see the points here are already being rendered differently. And when I zoom in, you can, you can now recognize the spheres. So I think this is a, a good example of uh, the, the modeling capabilities, what you can do with OpenCL Studio. So the scene tree uh, in conjunction with the shaders and the GL Lua package uh, allow you to do pretty much anything that you can do with uh, OpenGL, except you're doing it interactively. Okay, now let's have a look at this shader. And in particular, I'd like to have a look at the fragment shader. And up here, you can see a structure definition that defines a light source. And below it, an array of light sources and a counter of the number of light sources in the scene. Now, OpenCL Studio automatically fills in these variables and this structure. And in this particular case, there's only one light source in the scene, which is the one in front of the camera. That's always there, and you can turn that off via the scripting interface. So I will now show you how to tie a variable in the shader to a user interface widget. And what we'll do is use a slider to change the radius of uh, the spheres. And as you can see up here, there is a constant called point radius. And all we'll do is I will change this constant to a uniform variable. We we'll do that here in the fragment shader as well as in the vertex shader. Once I've done that, just hit control and to compile the shader. So when we now go back to the scene view, you can see the point set has disappeared. That's because the point radius is undefined. So let's insert a slider. And now let's drag and drop that slider into the script processor. And every time we move the slider, we'll now add code here to assign a value to the uniform variable in the shader. And for that, we will use a GL package. And the first thing we have to do is use the program, load the program. So we use the function GL use program. And the parameter to this function is the ID of the shader. Now our shader is located in the tree view here under opengl dot GL shader. And now if I hit colon, you can see there is a function called get glid. And this function basically returns the open glid of the shader program. And that's what you need to pass to open gl functions. So we've now activated the program. And afterward, we're done, we should also uh, unload it. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to get the attribute location of the, uh, the point set attribute. So I'll define a local variable here. And now we'll use the function gl get uniform location. This one's two parameters. One again is the program ID and the other one is the, the string of the uniform we're looking for. And it was called point radius. And then the last thing we have to do is simply assign a value to it. And we use another GL function, 
uniform 1f. This one requires the location. And now we need to put a value here, so we'll just use the uh, position of the slider. Since we're in the event handler of the slider, all I gotta do is event colon get position, and I'll multiply this by a factor of 30. Okay, now let's go compile the script and have a look at the scene view. Okay, when I start the application and move the slider, you can now see as expected, the uh, points are changing in size. When you hit reset, uh, you're back to zero. Um, now what I'd like to change here is when we're in editing mode, so after I hit reset, I still like to see the point set. And right now the, the point radius is, is, is just going to be zero. So I'll go back to the script processor. I will take this script here and I will turn it into a function. So then I'm going to the uh, application global and I will just create a function set radius and it needs a value. Then I'll paste this code in here. And, and all we're going to do is use this value instead of our the get position here. So now I compile this application global script and I can now use this function set radius simply by going underscore g access to global scope dot and somewhere here should be set radius. Now there's other functions in the global scope which are Lua intrinsic functions. But our set radius is here as well. And here we're going to pass in the positions of slider. So now that I've done that, I will now go to the on the positive event handler of the slider. That's basically the initialization step. Um, I will also call this function, but before I do it, I will go and set the slider position to 0 0.6. Compile the script. Go back to the scene view and hit return. And now that the, the spheres have a size. Okay, so now we'll add a light source to this scene. So I'll go back to the OpenGL subtree here. I'll insert a transformation node. And under the transformation node, let's say a spotlight. And as you can see here, the light cone has, a, has appeared. And now we'll have to zoom out a little bit uh, to see it more clearly. So what has happened uh, after you insert a transform node, OpenCL Studio basically puts it right in front of the, the camera a, a, a little distance. And now when you have done that, you have to back off a little bit so that you can see where the transform node is. In this case, it's right here. So I can now position that light source. And as you can see, it's already illuminating the point set. And when you select the light source and you go to the property sheet, you can, of course, change various attributes, such as the intensity of the light, attenuation, color, and so forth. So you can add as many light sources as you want to this scene. I just have to keep in mind that the performance uh, degradates quite quickly as the number increases. Because the shader I shown you earlier iterates uh, through all the light sources for uh, every pixel in the scene. And, uh, of course, that becomes a performance bottleneck quite quickly as the number of light sources increase. Now, OpenCL Studio also supports deferred lighting, um, which has two advantages. It allows you to add a lot more light sources, and you can also light non-geometry, uh, for example, things that you generate in an OpenCL program. And the Julia Fractal demo that comes with download OpenCL Studio is such an example where the geometry is created in an OpenCL kernel, and you have to use deferred lighting to light it. Um, but the fruit lighting will be covered in, uh, in an additional tutorial. So let's go ahead now and insert a triangle mesh into this scene. So I'll go back to the OpenGL subtree, insert a transform node, and then under the transform I will insert a, one of the predefined geometries, let's say a box. Now the box has appeared in the scene, and in the tree view a number of nodes have appeared. Well, there, there's again a shader to render the box. And below it, there's an index buffer. Um, and below those, there's a number of vertex attributes. Now, the vertex attributes are the same as in the point set. So if I select one of them and you look at the uh, property sheet, the only difference is now that they come out of a PLY file. So this interface here allows you to select the PLY file. And then you can, for this attribute, uh, select the corresponding attributes in the PLY file as well as the fields. Now, uh, PLY files are, are text files, so they, 
you can easily open one and, and uh, have a look at the elements in them, or you can easily create your own. And you don't necessarily have to import uh, uh, geometry information. The, the PLY files can contain all kinds of information, which you can load into the uh, attributes of, of a vertex. So let's have a look at the parent node here, the uh, index buffer. Now this is uh, somewhat different than the uh, parent node in the point set, because the, the, this geometry is indexed. It means that you require a set of indices to uh, determine which uh, vertices form a primitive. So you can here change the primitives just as we could with the point set, but you also need an index buffer. And the index buffer also comes out of the PLY file and you can select it here in the same manner as you can for the vertex attributes. Now the, the code to load the PLY files is also in a, a Lua plugin module, which means that the source code for that module is also in the workspace directory and that you can use uh, the Lua scripting interface as well to load and uh, uh, write PLY files from within the IDE. So there's only a few more things left that I would like to uh, show you under this OpenGL subtree before I go on and talk about the cameras and frame buffers. Um, one thing I haven't uh, shown you yet is the text. So if I insert a transform node, and then under the transform node I can insert a text. And if I move back a little bit, And you can now see manipulator here, and the text is usually in the uh, set Y plane. So it's a little bit difficult to find, you have to rotate around. And if you look at the proper sheet of the text, you can obviously change it. Uh, you can also change this programmatically from the scripting interface, and you can change the size. And the text also comes with its own shader, so you can customize uh, the rendering. So now let's uh, map a texture onto our box here in the scene. And what we'll do is go to the subtree of the box and insert a texture node. And when you select the texture and go to the property sheet, you can here on the, on the left hand side again see a file browser that allows you to choose a, a texture from the workspace directory. And over here you can specify various uh, uh, parameters. So let's go and select a texture. Let's go to textures, font, Here's a font texture that OpenCL Studio uses to render the text. And if I double click on it, it's not being loaded into the texture on the GPU. But you can see, if you look at it here, our box does not display the texture yet. And the reason being is because we're using the wrong shader. So if we select the shader and go back to its property shape, you can now see there is a predefined shader called texture. And when I select that, text, that shader, you can now see the texture is being mapped into the cube. Now, in addition to uh, an image file, you can also map a movie file to a texture, and OpenCL Studio will also automatically stream it. So I'll just illustrate this here. We'll go back to our texture object, go back to the file browser here, and go to videos, and there is a wildlife.avi. And now you can see the, uh, the movie is being mapped into the cube. Now keep in mind that uh, this video is now being streamed onto the GPU and you can use uh, either OpenCL kernels or uh, shaders to further process this video before it's being displayed. Also keep in mind that the source code for loading the, the videos and the images are also Lua plugins. So the source, it's available under the workspace directory and you can, have, uh, you can use the Lua scripting API to do all the things you have just done with the tree view. Okay, there's only one construct left here I haven't talked about, and that is a viewpoint. And when I insert a viewpoint, you can now see a view cone has appeared here, and basically it is just a marker in the scene. And if you double click on the viewpoint, the camera will now look at the scene from this point of view. And of course, you can also use the viewpoints within a scripting interface. So we'll now talk about cameras and frame buffers, and they're located up here on the top of the, the tree view. Um, when I select the camera, look at the property sheets, there isn't really very much you can change here. You can change things as the field of view uh, and the far and the near plane. And then here there is, a, there is an embedded help that shows you how to use the camera parameters uh, in an OpenCL kernel. But we'll deal with this uh, in a different tutorial. Then below the camera, there's a frame buffer. 
Now, the frame buffer has various attributes. Uh, you can change the dimensions of the frame buffer, um, as well as the storage parameters. And over here, you can specify the number of attachments. Now, in, an, in a shader, when the shader is used to render a geometry, it can output values that end up in different frame buffer attachments. For the most part, the color ends up in frame buffer attachment zero or one. But in, in, in some instances, you may, may want to output more information than just a color, and then you can use different frame buffer attachments. Now, for example, in deferred lighting, you the shaders not only output color, but also the surface normal and maybe some, some, some material information. And here you can specify in the user interface the number of the frame buffer attachments. So an important thing to understand is that at each time step, the camera, camera renders the scene into each one of the frame buffers that it has as a children. So right now there's only one frame buffer, but I can easily add another one. And now this scene is being drawn twice, once in this frame buffer, once into the other one. Now there's a number of things you can do with this. Um, you can either render the scene from different viewpoints into different frame buffers, or for example, you could uh, enable and disable parts of the, the scene tree, maybe use different shaders when you're rendering in different buffers. So and I will now illustrate how, how to use a, a second frame buffer. Um, what we're going to do is render the scene from the viewpoint we've just created into the second frame buffer. And then we're going to display the content of the frame buffer in the window here on the user interface. So the first thing we need to do is rename our new frame buffer so we can identify it. And then we're going to drag and drop it into the script processor. So we can now see the uh, pre-render event handler already contains some source code. It basically just sets up uh, the uh, frame buffer for rendering. And now all we need to do here is uh, change the viewpoint of the camera. So in the pre-render step, we're going to go camera, colon, and there is a function called push viewpoint. This basically assigns a new viewpoint to the camera and it stores the old one. And it takes as a parameter uh, a viewpoint object. And our viewpoint is in our OpenGL subtree on the view dot viewpoint and compile the script. And now what we need to do in the post render, after we're done, we also should pop the viewpoint and use the uh, the previous one. So we can still navigate with the, with the camera. Okay. So after we've done this and go back to the scene, and you can see nothing has changed um, uh, because the second frame buffer is being rendered now uh, from the, the new viewpoint, but uh, we're not displaying it, so you can't really see the content of the frame buffer. So let's go ahead then and now insert a window under the user interface. And then under the window, uh, let's insert a canvas. And now I'm going to drag and drop that canvas into the script processor so that I can begin to paint uh, content into it. So inside the canvas now, I'd like to implement the onPaint event handler. Now, the before I can do that, I have to make sure that this event handler is even being called. So we'll go to the onTime, which is called at every time step, and we'll call the repaint function of the canvas. And this will now trigger the onPaint event handler. And in here, I will now use another Lua plugin module called canvas. And it has a function called paint texture 2D. I won't go much into the into detail about this, um, this package. We'll talk about it more in a different tutorial. But the paint texture 2D function um, requires as its first parameter a shader. And basically in OpenGL 4.2, all the rendering is done through shaders. And even though the paint texture function does uh, paint a texture on the screen, it does not supply the shader. So we'll have to add a shader here under a canvas node insert a shader object. And then if I go to the property sheet of the shader, you can go here under canvas, and there is only so far um, two predefined shaders, and one is called textured. And now we can go back to our function here, call cool. paint texture to the, the first argument has to be the shader. So we go event dot shader colon. And now you can see there is a function called uh, called glid again. This one returns uh, 
the, the shader ID that we need to pass to the OpenGL function calls. The second argument now needs to be a texture that you like to paint. And that texture is part of our frame buffer. So OpenCL Studio frame buffer attachment are textures and they can be treated as such. So we have to find a texture, go to camera dot frame buffer two. And if I call them, this also has a function glid where this function requires an argument where you specify the frame buffer attachment. In our case, it's just attachment zero. And now all we need to do here is specify um, the rectangle on the screen where this texture is being painted on. And it's just a dimension of the canvas. Okay, we compile the change and uh, have a look at the scene. Back at the scene, I have to start the simulation because uh, the on-time event handler is only called when uh, the simulation application is running. And as you can see now, uh, the scene is being rendered from a different from a different viewpoint. And I can still navigate in the background, I change the main camera, and this window just always shows the image uh, from the particular viewpoint we have, we have defined. So this basically sums up the introduction to uh, rendering in OpenCL Studio. Uh, there will be additional tutorials that cover particular aspects in, uh, in more detail, but I believe this introduction should give you a good overview on, uh, on the capabilities and what you can do with OpenCL Studio. Also keep in mind that all the buffers I talked about here, the vertex attributes, the textures, the frame buffers, they can be passed to OpenCL kernels via the OpenCL OpenGL interoperability. And this means that you can use OpenCL kernel code to drive much of the visualizations uh, that you see here. So the demos that come with OpenCL Studio uh, do just that. Uh, they use OpenCL kernels to produce geometry or process images, which are then being displayed via these rendering capabilities. The demos in general are a good starting point um, to get going with OpenCL Studio. Pretty much all the capabilities of the tool are applied in some form or another um, in, the, in the demos.